The month of May is AAPI Heritage Month. So at NBC 10 Boston, for 10 questions with NBC 10 Boston, we are highlighting people from the AAPI community and hearing their story. So today we have Abby Chin, who is currently the Celtic host and reporter at NBC Sports Boston. Abby, thank you for giving me some time today. Thank you for having me, Kwani. I'm excited. Thank you, of course. And first, for those who don't follow the Celtics or follow sports at all, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how you ended up here in Boston. My upbringing. I am one of three girls. My father is um, 100% Chinese. He was born in China, but actually moved to Hong Kong, I think, when he was very young. And then he immigrated to Jamaica, came to the United States for school, University of Michigan, um, and ended up staying. And that's where he met my mom. So, and my mom is from a farm in Ohio. She is, you know, born and bred um, in the heartland. So they met in Ohio, but my dad growing up, even though I was one of three girls, sports were a huge part of our lives, whether we were watching it on the TV, cheering, I grew up in Denver. So cheering for the Broncos and, um, or playing sports. I started playing soccer, ran track when I was growing up, my middle sister, um, straight off the path a little bit. And she played volleyball and softball, but Growing up, we were always traveling for someone's tournaments or going somewhere, doing something. Um, and so sports were a big part of my life. And then I went to school and I knew I wanted to be in journalism. I realized that you could do just broadcasting. And then my sophomore year of college, I took a sports broadcasting class. And that's when I realized that you could just do sports. So it put together all of my passions in one place. Um, and I jumped on the opportunity. And so since then, I've been trying to forge that path and things are going pretty well. <laughs> um, I moved to Boston uh, for to work for Comcast Sportsnet as a reporter and anchor, not even on the sidelines yet. Um, this is my eighth season, so about nine years ago. And then um, there was kind of a shakeup in the broadcast team and... Um, our boss, Len Mead at the time, asked me if I'd be interested in sidelines. And I said, heck yes. Right. <laughs> and so the rest is history. I came in the same season that Brad Stevens did. So we have been in Boston and with the Celtics the same amount of time. Brad's, you know, had a much bigger job than me. But um, <laughs> this season is my first season fully behind the desk as the host. And it has been a really fun experience doing that with Perk and Scal and Mike Gorman and Chris Forsberg and getting to be a part of that crew has been really fun too. So all good things and all because my dad really had a passion for sports and instilled that in his girls. I love that. And when you mentioned that you realized that one, you could do broadcast and then eventually you realize that it could specifically be about sports. When was the first time you actually saw yourself represented or if you did at all? That's a good question. I think, I, I grew up, it, it's very cliche, um, knowing when I realized I wanted to do broadcast journalism, I, of course, wanted to be Katie Couric on the Today Show. And um, I think it's still a dream of mine to do a morning show. Um, I think it just fits I mean, my NBC, NBC. I know, but I, I do the exact opposite. And we're up till after midnight talking about basketball, which right, I right. love as well. Um, but I think, you know, Connie Chung was in the news. Um, on news shows and things like that. And then, uh, but growing up, really the only place you saw women in sports was on the sidelines. And um, I remember watching Melissa Stark do Monday Night Football. And I thought that that was just the most amazing job. And um, I think it would be, I thought it would be incredible to do that. But you're right. When you talk about the Asian American community, I, I really can't point to any um, heroes that I had in that world. And for better or for worse, I think, you know, seeing is believing, but I also think that it's really important for, I'm, I'm really thankful for the way that um, my parents raised me and, and brought me up in a place where I, because, even though I didn't see it, I, I didn't think that it wasn't possible. And a lot of times with broadcasts specifically and media overall, there's always a grind. People may not see it, but it's always there. For those who don't know about the industry, what was your grind like? Um, my first job out of college actually was incredible. Um, I had submitted a resume to ESPN to be uh, for their internship program two years prior. They called me, I mean, probably a month before graduation and said, we have this job. It's um, 
a production assistant for ESPN Classic, and I just happened to get lucky because they were looking for diverse candidates. And I, I checked two of those boxes because I was a woman in sports, and I also had um, my last name is Chin. And so, you know, it's pretty obvious. So I got the call. I said, yes, I can be there tomorrow. Whatever you need, I am, I am there. And so I was a production assistant at ESPN Classic, um, and the job was nine to five, Monday through Friday. I mean, oh. it was a lot of going through really old tape and watching old sporting events and um, a lot of, uh, now I can't think of the name, uh, the ABC show that was like the wide world of sports watching. Oh, sports. Yeah. Um, but it was great because it was nine to five, which does not happen in sports, does not happen in broadcasting, like is, is just unheard of. And I didn't know it at the time. So, uh, you know, I, I went into my office and uh, was just living life. And then a lot of the production assistants at ESPN were very young. So we were all in the same um, stage of our life. So a lot of us were, you know, just, we had our first job, had, had our own income for the first time and everyone was hanging out. It was kind of like college graduate school 2.0. Um, and I met my husband there and you know, we, we didn't get married for a long time, but we met there and uh, it was a wonderful experience. And then I realized after a few years at ESPN that if I wanted to be on air, I probably should make the jump sooner rather than later. And I am lucky. I don't I don't look that old. But, um, you know, at, when I was 25, I didn't know that <laughs> I would still look young for a while. So I figured I should probably do it before all the wrinkles set in. Um, and so I thankfully, so coming out of school for my broadcasting tape, I didn't get any bites. I mean, you know, I sent out a hundred tapes across the country to every market and heard absolutely nothing back. And uh, now that I'm here, I completely understand my tape was terrible. Uh, but since I was at ESPN and I had made some connections, I found a photographer and, and reshot a new tape. And I got one call and it was from Montgomery, Alabama. And I think the reason I got the call is because the sports director there also went to the University of Colorado, which is where I went. So I think he was a little intrigued. Um, and it just happened that Mike, my now husband, uh, his brother lived in Alabama, and so we had kind of a soft landing spot for that. So I worked part-time, work, making $9 an hour, my first job in Montgomery, Alabama. I was the fourth person in that sports office, so I was driving around all parts of the state. And if anyone who's covered um, high school sports and, and worked in local news, you know, it's just you are driving yourself all over. You go to three or four games a night. And all you're trying to do is get either one basket, one touchdown, one play that you can throw on that highlight, and then you're on to the next thing. And so um, it was amazing because it was the first time I had ever actually been the one, been a one man band. And Kwani, I can tell you, I remember my first, my very first live shot in Montgomery, like it was yesterday. So I tell this to people all the time. Some people are naturally able to just go in front of a camera and be themselves. I'm not one of those people. So my very first live shot from Montgomery, I remember I wrote it out that morning. I knew exactly what I was going to say. I rehearsed it in my head all day long. And as soon as the camera hit me, I was, as soon as um, the sports director, his name is Jeff Shear. He's amazing. He's one of my favorite people in this whole world. Tossed to me. I spat out my thing as fast as I could. And I said, back to you, Jeff. And oh we were God. still under video. And it was just like, I'm done. That's all I had to say. And that's all you get. <laughs> so um, I've come a long way since then. And I was actually laid off from that job. But um, someone in Birmingham, another sports director in Birmingham, saw me at a Nick Saban University of Alabama press conference and just saw how hard I worked and um, saw that I actually asked a question and um, was able to do the job well. And so he took a chance on me and offered me or, and found a way to kind of fit me in in Birmingham. Um, and what I remember about that, and anyone who has been in this business knows, the one-man bands is legit. And so back in the day, it wasn't, I mean, it was a while ago, uh, the cameras were very big. I'm, I'm grateful that we didn't also have to have like a tape deck. I've heard horror stories about that. But you also have your laptop for editing and your tripod. And so you're just weighed down. And I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. And everywhere I went, men are like, you all right there, darling? Can I open that door for you, sweetheart? And, uh, and, and my go-to line was, it's all right. I'm perfectly balanced because I just had enough hanging uh, up. Yeah. I was able to stand up straight. Um, 
But the worst part about that is during football season in Alabama, there are these huge rainstorms. And so, you know, you're trying to shoot a football game um, and you have to run from end zone to end zone because you want the team coming at you when they score their touchdown. And then like through downpours and all of that. And then at the end of the day, you have to somehow get yourself together, make your hair look good, put on enough makeup to be able to shoot a stand up by yourself in front of a tripod. So who knows how many times uh, that's gonna take. And then you quickly go back and edit everything together and shoot it off back to the studio. So um, I think that is certainly, it's a training ground and experiences that I will never forget. I'm truly grateful for, but in the moment it was a lot. I remember Kwani, and I probably shouldn't be saying this. I was filming a, uh, softball or no, it was baseball practice in Alabama, and it was so hot. I was wearing shorts. I sweat through like I had a notebook in my back pocket. I I sweat through the notebook like I couldn't read my notes because. Oh just, my God. And then I had to somehow do this stand up. My hair was like this, and I was like Alabama baseball. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was it was fun. Now that, I guess that's why you ended up in New England. Now that, I can, you it the cold. <laughs> now that it's in the past, I can say it was fun. <laughs> right, exactly. It's funny when you look back at it, but in the moment, I'm sure it wasn't funny at all. Yes. But one um, of the questions that we've been asking, we have a separate project that we're doing here at NBC10 Boston. And a lot of times when people see someone of Asian descent, they'll say, where are you from? Mm -hmm. With the implications of trying to, I guess, get their identity. So have you gotten that question? And if you do, how, how do you usually answer it? Uh, yes. And not as much anymore, I think, because people know my full name. Um, but when I was growing up, I got that question all the time. And I didn't know. I grew up in a suburb in Colorado. Um, it was not very diverse at all. I remember in my elementary school, in my grade, it was myself and one other child who was African-American, and that was it. So for better or for worse, I didn't really notice or realize that I was different. And it was only the grownups who said, so where are you from? And um, I'd say, I'm from here. I'm from, from Colorado. And they're like, no, but where are you from? And, um, and I would say, well, I guess my dad is Chinese. But then I also, Kwani, you talk about like filling boxes. I, I am not, because um, I'm only 50% Chinese, you know, a, a lot of people will mistake me for either a Latino or um, part African-American. And, and mm. so it is a question a lot of people ask of um, where I feel like I the way I look is a little bit more ambiguous. And so um, I did get that question a lot, but I at the time I didn't think that it was because of um, my Asian descent. I just thought that people weren't really sure. Now looking back and, and knowing more, um, I realized just how inappropriate that question is, especially for a young child. For sure, absolutely. And I know that you've been involved with like AJA and organizations like that. Do you see, why do you see a value in being involved in groups that in, hopefully encourage diversity in media specifically? I think, I mean, and even just being a mom, I have realized, come to realize how helpful it is, how meaningful it is to talk to people who have been through similar experiences and to know that you're not alone, to know that you're not the only one going through that. And then to also be able to seek out advice and, and speak to people who have been there before and have done that. And um, I think that that is those are invaluable resources. And then also to feel like you have someone who has your back, who is looking out for you. Um, I think it's really hard to find in broadcast media. And um, just to know that you do have that safety net, if you will, that there is someone there. There is There are people there who um, care about you and are have your best interest at heart, I think is something that um, can be hard to find in this business. And when you do find it, it's something that you need to hang on to. And work aside, because a lot of times we identify ourselves, whether it's our culture or our jobs, how do you identi identify yourself outside of work, whether it's like your hobbies or other things that you do? 
as a mom, mostly, um, <laughs> if I'm not studying or listening to a basketball podcast or watching NBA League Pass or on Twitter, on Instagram, because as we know, that is a huge part of our lives as well. I'm just hanging with the kids and actually trying not to look at my phone, which actually can be very, very difficult. <laughs> so especially because my kids are young, my daughter Mabel is five and my son Silas is two. And I think the hardest part about this pandemic is uh trying to deny screen time, which then means that we as parents are on. So yeah, keep them entertained, get them out of the house, do whatever you can, and also provide ample snacks because that is a huge demand. I can see that. I, I actually saw a tweet a few days ago saying that the iPad should get a Mother's Day card or something to that extent. Right. <laughs> oh, I get it. But I wish, and the problem is like it's for my kids are so young. I just, I can't. I don't, I can't feel good about sticking them in front of that, but it, it's hilarious watching my two-year-old sit in front of a television and he is just like in awe. He watched an episode of The Magic School Bus recently Ooh, and my husband said his, he like didn't blink once. His, his eyes were just like tearing because he was like, what is happening? I mean, Mrs. Frizzle is amazing, so I get him. <laughs> no, no question. <laughs> so uh, I think that, that's really how I identify right now is as a mother, a working mother, mm -hmm. which everyone, all of the moms out there, no matter what they're doing, understand just how real that job is. And so as soon as I close the door to their bedroom at eight o'clock on the nights when I am home, I sit down on the couch and I just want to mm. veg out and not move. So <laughs> sadly, my hobbies are children and watching television. <laughs> but how has been work being a working mother been, especially being in broadcast media, a schedule that's very tedious. You look at the NBA season, it's literally day in and day out. How have you been able to manage that? It has been a challenge, especially because in years past, all up until now, I traveled with the team and was at almost every road game. Um, and so I couldn't have done it without the support of my husband, obviously. And um, we also, to add to the challenge of that, don't have any family really nearby at all. So we don't have the help of grandparents or anything like that. Um, we have had to figure out childcare solutions. Um, but I will say one thing that's really cool about our jobs, because it does happen, my job, I guess, uh, is because it does happen at night, is that I'm home a lot of the day. So I have spent, I mean, like I said, Mabel's Five now. I, I've spent the better part of all five of those years with her. I, I get up with her in the morning. I take her to school every day now um, this year because I've been able to be home working in the studio. And, and then Silas and I typically go do an adventure in the morning before his babysitter comes and takes over for the afternoon. And so I do feel like that time is very special. I know um, my husband who works nine to five, I feel like a lot of days I actually spend more time with the kids than he is able to do because he is locked into that specific schedule. So it is a balance as with everything. Um, and honestly, Kwani, I think the hardest part was uh, after Silas was born, coming back from maternity leave, um, the Celtics were uh, just starting in the playoffs. And so Silas, because he was so young, he was two or three months old. He went with me on trips, but um, I was still nursing. And so to... My sister had to come with me. We went to his, <laughs> it's so funny, Silas's first road trips were to Indianapolis and Milwaukee. It was very glamorous. <laughs> um, my sister went with me in Indiana and then my dad met us in Milwaukee and had to take care of Silas um, while I was at the games. And it was, uh, I just remember coming back to the hotel in M Milwaukee and my dad sitting there holding a crying Silas in the pitch black because he's like, he won't sleep. I think he's really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> like, didn't want to turn on all the lights. And so um, just kind of managing that and, and dealing with that. And that next season, I was still nursing. And so um, and we're lucky NBC had some great resources. I was able to uh, mail milk back and forth. And um, But what's funny is that when I initially went to HR, they didn't know those resources were available. So we had to search for it. And so I think it's just um, communication helping mothers know what is available, what resources they do have. And I think that those are a, those challenges remain. And just to help new mothers um, feel supported in the workplace is huge. And, and it is, it was really challenging um, 
I feel like when I first did it with Mabel, I, I bought a bunch of books and was trying to figure out how women go back to work and how they balance that. And I never really found a good resource for that. It's just something that you kind of, you know, are feeling your way through the dark and suddenly you find yourself out on the other side of it. This is very timely. I didn't plan this, but Mother's Day was a few days ago. So here you are giving parenting tips. <laughs> but I know we don't really want to talk about the Celtics, but you also are really good at bringing the positivity. So as we close out, what are your playoff predictions? And if you don't have any at all, then what are you looking forward to maybe next season? <laughs> I am really hopeful as the Celtic Celtics sit in the seventh seed of the East right now. Um, I am trying to keep the perspective that that's kind of cool that the Celtics, one of the most storied franchises in the NBA will play in the inaugural play in tournament. So that's something <laughs> I am hopeful. Um, and especially I think after hearing Kemba Walker speak post game last night and how much he values just making it to the postseason in general. And I, and you know, Evan Fournier, the new addition feels the same way. Um, I'm hopeful that they will, win that first game, no matter who the opponent is uh, in the playing tournament and then make it into the postseason, the actual playoffs. Right. Um, I'm not necessarily bullish on their chances after that, because you look at those top three seeds in uh, the Sixers with Joel Embiid, who the Celtics do not have an answer for. The Nets, I think, I mean, Kyrie Irving took a tough shot to the head last night, um, but if they are any sort of semblance of healthy as we've seen this season the Celtics just not on the same level as them and then the Bucks with Giannis mm. have gotten better this season um and that will be a tall tall order if that is who the Celtics end up playing in that first round so I am hopeful for a first round series because I think that's really important for us at yeah. NBC Sports Boston and for me because it would be my first time hosting um, yeah. on the desk for a playoff series. So that's something that I'm really hopeful for. And I think that that experience will be good for the younger guys who are on the roster. As for next season, I am, and, and I don't think it's just because you could call me a green teamer, but I am I am not for blowing it up. I do not think wholesale changes are needed, and I do not think there is any way that Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum will be traded this summer. Yeah. And I think that for this season with the Celtics and the um, getting nowhere near what was expected of them, I think all of us underestimated just what it is and what it means to put a franchise – on the shoulders of two young men in Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown who haven't done it before. And yes, we've seen them excel in the postseason and they have accomplished incredible things in their young careers, but they've never had to be the face of the franchise and be the ones answering those questions after losses and taking all of the shots when you look at, um, not on the court, taking all the shots from the media and Boston sports talk radio and all of that. And, and I, I do think it's it's harder than I ever thought it was that it was, and it's harder than I think even they thought it was. And so I do think this season will be a learning experience. I um, have learned in all the years covering Jason and Jalen to never doubt their capabilities. And so I do think that if you kind of change some of the pieces around them and give them a few more resources, I think that the Celtics team could be great. And I know that those two can be great together. So I am not one calling for wholesale changes in this off season. There we go. Abby's word. And to your point, the fact that they have been inconsistently consistent this past season and still were able to manage to be in the playing game. That is a positive note, I would say as well. So Good point. <laughs> Thank you so much. Up here in Boston, Kwani. We play for championships here. Exactly. So, you're right. It's it's tough finding silver linings, but and thank you for finding one. Abby Chin of NBC Sports Boston. Thank you for joining 10 Questions with NBC 10 Boston.